Okay. And now we are. Should I be like off video until it's my turn? Whatever you want. I don't know. Hello, everybody. Welcome. We'll wait a minute for people to come in and then we'll get going with the evening's event. Okay, the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice of the University of San Francisco acknowledges our presence on the unceded land of the indigenous Ohlone communities and pays our respects to these traditional caretakers and elders, past, present, and emerging. It is our intention that this acknowledgement plays a role in a much larger process of confronting the past in order to create a not yet realized future rooted in justice. Welcome everyone to the sixth annual USF SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice human rights lecture, where tonight Dr. Clarence Jones will address the topic of racism, anti-Semitism, and Israel-Palestine. After the lecture, he will be joined in conversation with USF rabbi in residence, Rabbi Camille Angel. There will be time for Q&A after the conversation, and you'll see you have a little Q&A box in the uh, bottom right corner of, of your screen. You can type in your questions in that box at any time during the evening, and we will do our best to make sure we can get to your question. My name is Oren Kroll Zeldin, and I am the interim director of the SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice. I want to begin by thanking the SWIG JSSJ faculty and staff, as well as the Department of Theology and Religious Studies and the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice for co-sponsoring this event. I'd like to take a brief moment to tell you about our SWIG program in Jewish Studies and Social Justice. Founded in 1977, our program is the first Jewish Studies chair or program at a Catholic university anywhere in the world. In 2008, we were reestablished as the SWIG program in Jewish studies and social justice, the first academic program worldwide to formally link Jewish studies with social justice. Including a minor in Jewish studies and social justice, in the classroom, the program offers a wide range of significant Jewish studies courses not found in other educational settings. And beyond the classroom, we offer extraordinary events that are all free and open to the public, such as tonight's event, which concludes our series of events for this fall semester. Through the SWIG JSSJ program, we believe that education is the best long-term way to create systemic change. Whether one has the time to take a semester-long course or a mere few hours to hear from a single speaker, education is fundamental to making our world better, paramount in shining the spotlight on the margins, on oppressed communities who are mistreated merely because of their race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or another social identity altogether. Thank you for coming tonight. And I would now like to introduce my colleague, Jonathan Greenberg to tell you more about the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. Thank you so much to uh, Professor Kroll Zeldin to be here is very much an honor for me. I'm excited about uh, this evening. I am the Senior Associate Director and Scholar in Residence at the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. My life has been profoundly impacted by my uh, learning from and discussing with and becoming friends with Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who you'll hear from this evening. 
and I'm very honored that he asked me to join him as co-founders of our institute. Dr. Jones is the director of our institute at USF. And as you'll hear more, he was the former lawyer, political advisor, and draft speechwriter for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our mission at the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice is to further the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King by promoting the theory, practice, and methods of nonviolence that he used, taught, and lived as applied to the crises that we face as a society and a world today and to pass on that knowledge and learning through dialogue and teaching and training to new generations. I wanted to make uh, three very brief initial observations this evening. Uh, the first is that Martin Luther King is often seen and understandably so as a civil rights leader. But this is not how he understood himself. He understood himself to be a minister of the gospel. His journey and the national journey that he led was a primarily spiritual journey, of course, with profound political and social impact. Dr. King was a Christian and his movement was profoundly connected to the culture and social community of the black church, primarily in the South and throughout the United States. His movement, as you will hear tonight, was also profoundly an interfaith movement. A central part of this interfaith movement was the deep and unbreakable bond between the Jewish and black communities in America during the struggle to overcome Jim Crow. This aligned so profoundly with the story of Exodus that it has always been the central story of the Jewish people and a profoundly important, deep story of liberation for Black Americans from slavery through Jim Crow to the present. Second, the arc of Martin Luther King's life's work can be described as an evolution from a focus on civil rights, the rights of citizens in our country, to a focus on human rights for all people with greatest attention to the poorest, most oppressed, and most vulnerable in our community. I believe that it's very appropriate and proper that Dr. Clarence B. Jones is giving the SWIG program's human rights lecture this evening in this tradition. Uh, third, Dr. Jones will be properly introduced by Rabbi Camille Angel in just a moment. I'd like to offer one personal note, again, about religion. Dr. Jones was brought up by Protestant parents and also by Catholic nuns. He spent years side by side with Dr. King and other pastors from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Sunday morning Baptist services and church meetings throughout the week. My life has been changed, as I said at the opening, by Dr. Jones in so many profound ways. And one of those ways is that I have become more intimately connected to and proud of my own Jewish heritage because of the enormous privilege of spending time with Dr. Jones and witnessing the living history that he conveys so beautifully and powerfully as you will learn this evening. So I'm honored to be here as part of this wonderful event representing the USF Institute for Nonviolence and Social Justice. We welcome your engagement with our institute throughout the year and I pass on to Rabbi Camille Angel, the introduction of Dr. Jones. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening, students, colleagues. It's amazing to be together on this night when we can hear from you, Dr. Jones. Your short biography that I'm to read reveals a fraction of the influence your thoughts and words have meant all these years. Dr. Clarence B. Jones served as legal counsel, strategic advisor, and draft speech writer to Martin Luther King Jr. from 1960 until Dr. King's assassination in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th, 1968. Throughout these years, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. depended on Dr. Jones for legal and strategic counsel and assistance with the drafting of landmark speeches and public testimony 
and Dr. Jones was privy to Reverend King's decision-making processes and political struggles. Among other leading roles in his historic relationship with Dr. King, Dr. Jones met alone with Dr. King when he was incarcerated in Birmingham, Alabama in April, 1963 and helped him to smuggle out and publish the iconic letter from a Birmingham jail. He helped to negotiate a settlement with the city of Birmingham and the United States Justice Department to successfully resolve the Birmingham campaign. Dr. Jones worked with Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph to plan the March on Washington for jobs and freedom in August of 1963. And he drafted the first seven and a half paragraphs of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Across the decades following Dr. King's assassination on April 4th, 1968, Clarence B. Jones worked to carry on Dr. King's legacy to continue the nonviolent struggle for social justice, voting rights, and democratic inclusion in a path breaking career in law, business, finance, and communications journalism, conflict resolution, teaching, writing, and, pu and policy advocacy. It's a personal highlight to hear you speak, to honor your wisdom and elderhood as a social justice, human rights, lifetime activist. Your words are in my heart and literally in my prayer book, Dr. Jones. So I am eager to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that uh, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. <clears throat> I believe that it is uh, important <clears throat> that uh, those of us who are participating, participating in this uh, Zoom uh, conference, that we start with the um, uh, uh, same baseline of information because some of you know me and some of you know about me and others of you know less about me. So let me speak about myself briefly in my own words. I'm the son of living domestic household servants. My uh, Father had a fourth grade education. My mother had uh, a seventh or eighth grade education. Um, I lived with my parents in the home that they, of their employer, uh, until uh, I was six years old. Um, and, and, and when I lived with them, I lived uh, in the service quarters. My mother, who was a very religious person, uh, herself had been influenced by uh, the Catholic uh, upbringing, decided that she wanted to put her only son in a Catholic boarding school so that at the age of six in uh, 1937, I was born in 1931, I was put in a Catholic boarding school run by the uh, order of the uh, uh, sac uh, Blessed Sacrament. And this was a a Catholic order that uh, had a boarding school for for um, uh, it said on the plaque of the school for indigent colored boys and for Indians. And the reason they did that is because the order of the Blessed Sacrament maintained mission schools in Arizona and New Mexico for Indians, so that when I went to this boarding school in uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, 
uh, 30% maximum, somewhere between 25 and 30% of the uh, young boys there were, for, were uh, from the reservations in Arizona and New Mexico. I remember being uh, punished for uh, 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 putting the, uh, the pigtail, the Indian boys wore their hairs either singly or sometimes doubly in pigtails. And I put one of the Indian boys pigtails in the inkwell in the desk that I had and I was uh, punished for that. But among other things, um, uh, my parents loved me and, uh, and these uh, nuns, I just remember them as being just these white women with these uh, um, things around their faces. Many of them had uh, eyeglasses, and um, and they 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 spoke to us in ways that were very uh, uh, um, compelling. Um, Master Jones. Be a good boy. Um, Jesus loves you. We love you. And you are beautiful. Master Jones, be a good boy. Jesus loves you. And you are beautiful. And you can imagine the effect of what that has on a colored boy from the age of six until he's 14, before he goes off to public schools. So this had a profound impact on me. So when I went to, uh, when I went to public high school, um, in a uh, town in uh, South Jersey, Palmyra High School, Palmyra, New Jersey. I was exempt to, from taking Latin, for example, because I had religious Latin. And so I didn't have to take any Latin. And, uh, and I learned, and, and it became, well, I say it became clear, but it didn't become clear until later on that the uh, nature of the, um, and the quality of the education I had in the Catholic schools uh, was superior to the, what I, uh, I would have received had I gone to, undoubtedly what would have been a segregated school at the time. So that I excelled in high school. Um, um, High schools, a public high school, 70% uh, white, 30% uh, Negro or colored, as we were called. And I uh, ended up being the president of the uh, School Honor Society. I was, uh, um, uh, I was selected to by my classmates to be most likely to succeed. And I was uh, the valedictorian of my class. And that is because reflectively looking back on it, because I had gotten a better education. Now, I didn't know, maybe Maybe there was some talk. I mean, I, I was a, I was an altar boy. Maybe you know, maybe there was some talk of Jews. Maybe maybe I don't have any recollection of it. 
But when I went to Columbia College um, in 1949, as a, uh, as a, uh, a scholarship, as a um, student at Columbia University on a four-year uh, academic scholarship, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at Columbia College. And one day while I'm at Columbia College, after we go through this orientation week, we are told to go down and uh, look at, uh, at the bulletin board to where the classes we have been assigned. So I was a, uh, living in Hartley Hall, I've been assigned to a room in Hartley Hall with three other white boys. By the way, there were only 13 Negroes in a class of 3,000 boys, young men at college in uh, Columbia in 1949. So I, 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 I look at the, the bulletin board and I've been assigned and, I, and, a young, and a young man standing behind me, he, from, he was from Texas and he and I become friends. friends. And I hear, me, I hear him tell me, Jonesy boy, I'm going to tell you what he said. He says, you are fucked. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't you see? I said, what are you talking about? He said, don't you see, uh, you, don't you see the classes and the sections to which you've been assigned? I said, no. And then he pointed out to me, which didn't even make any difference to me, that the sections of the classes to which I had been assigned were classes of students of, who went to high schools, of students of high schools, didn't mean any, I didn't know that high schools, they didn't mean, they didn't mean anything to me, like Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Boys High, uh, Bronx High School of Science, uh, Little Red School House, uh, uh, Ethical College, they didn't mean anything to me. He said, he said, you you could have been assigned to all those kikes. So I turned to him, I said, well, what's a kike? He said, I know you must be smart because you got in Columbia, you, but you are one dumb Negro. A kike is a Jew boy dummy. And, and, and don't you need a B minus average to maintain your academic scholarship? I said, yeah, he says, well, you're gonna sign to all those kikes, man. That's all they do is study. The book's gonna be hard for you to keep up. So I said, well, it is what it is, you know? I mean, I don't know what I said, it is what it is, but I said, nothing I can do. So to make a long story short, during the course of my time at Columbia, I got a really experience of, uh, of what it meant to be a, a Jew in America. First of all, the so-called kikes that my uh, Southern Columbia classmates lamented against, they ended up being uh, some of my best friends. And yes, we, I and they ended up being some of the better students in the class. And I remember one um, uh, incident that made me come to understand uh, what it was to be Jewish. I mean, I didn't understand it really. One of my dearest friends, a fellow by the name of Norman Frankel, who had invited me at the time he lived, he and his family lived on, on uh, uh, the Grand Concourse in New York City. He had invited me to his home. His sister's name was Audrey. He had invited me. I had been into their home. His parents embraced me like I was like one of their sons. And, and Norman was a junior Phi Beta Kappa. He was a senior ahead of me. And so one day I see him, his eyes are bloodshot. And I said, what's wrong? He says, I didn't get into PNS. I said, what are you talking about? PNS is a college of physicians and surgeons. So what do you mean you didn't get into PNS? Well, I didn't get into PNS. Well, I was so, I was so 
outraged. I immediately walked into the dean's office. The dean was Dean Coleman. He saw me coming in and I said, what is this with Norman Franklin? He says, Clarence, calm down. I know Norman um, put his application in later than he should have. And, and Columbia at the medical school maintains a quota system. So I said, well, so what's that? He said, well, they had already fulfilled their quota system for the admission of Jews to the Columbia Medical School. So I said, so what? Norman's a junior Phi Beta Kappa. So yeah, but um, they've already got their quota. And that's when I began to, I never heard that. Now here I am. I am a sophomore at Columbia. And I had never heard anything like that. And then, of course, another experience I had, which was, you know, when you're, although I had a scholarship that paid me, I paid for my tuition, and room and board, and a check, I think, I don't know. I think it was $90 a month. I was always hungry, never had enough money. And I became friendly with someone who didn't, didn't go to Columbia, but it was a student at NYU by the name of Robert Baron Nemiroff. And Robert Baron Nemiroff and I became friendly and his parents owned, at that time, the, the, most, the only and most popular Israeli restaurant in New York City called the Habibi. So, uh, 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 Bobby's mother, May Mamanoff, she spoke no English. So Bobby would bring me to the restaurant to have, to get something to eat. Because uh, with me, uh, they eat at, you know, at the restaurant. And his mother took a great affection to me. And she would, um, she would go around and pinch my sides. Uh, uh, my, and say, you have no, I can feel your ribs. You have no, you have no, she would say that in, uh, in uh, Yiddish because she spoke no English. And, um, and, and Bobby would say, mama, he's okay, he's okay. Leave him alone, leave him alone, so forth. And even the consequence of that, first of all, I ate regularly at an Israeli restaurant and got good food. But a consequence of that relationship over a period of time, in years, two or three years, I began to, uh, May Nemiroff, who was like a second mother to me, I began to, uh, you know, I went to the Juilliard School of Music in 1947, before I went to Columbia, so I had ear training, so my ears were very attuned to sound. And so I, uh, I began to uh, phonetically pick up Yiddish, so I began to speak and understand Yiddish when I was a second year student, third year student at Columbia, because I, because I heard so much of it from someone that I love. So that's an early life experience. And then of course, uh, I, mean, I mean, I had no way of knowing that uh, In the second week in February, I would become the uh, political advisor, lawyer, and just speechwriter for Martin Luther King Jr. for the next seven and a half years. I was 29, and we, he was 31. There's no way I could have anticipated that. But during that seven and a half year, experience, I learned many things. And among the many things that I learned and observed was Martin Luther King Jr.'s implacable, implacable, um, 
um, uh, offenses uh, against anti-Semitism. It just it was something he could not abide. And uh, I came also by working with him and understanding that during the seven and a half year period, I worked with him, you know, everybody credits him that Martin Luther King was brilliant, he was this, he was that, you know? Yeah, he was all of those things. But he was a political pragmatist. And he recognized that no matter how compelling on the merits, the case for ending racial segregation was uh, Negroes, as we were described and self-described in the early 1960s, there's no way in hell that Negroes, 12% of the population, were going to impose its demand for any racial segregation on 88% of the population. It simply was not going to happen. So the challenge, therefore, the brilliance that Martin King saw, and he came to transmit that to those of us who worked closely with him, that we had to get a majority of 88% of the population, white people, to support us. You know, in those days, you know, I mean, all white people look alike to me. 88% of the population. And then I came to see from my own ex experience that there was a segment of the 88% of the population from a distance, they look white, but as you get up closer, they were certain distinguishing figures and they were Jews. And the Jewish population, a minority uh, population in the United States. Nevertheless, they were a majority of the white population that responded to our call for assistance. And I, being the curious person that I am, I, 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 when I would see young white people, I'd go up and ask them, what, 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 what are you doing here? Why are you helping us? Why, 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 where do you come from? And the common denominator, not in every case, but the, the most often common denominator was that they were a child or a grandchild of someone in their family who had experienced the Holocaust. And somehow they connected in their own minds and their families that this is something that their grandparents would want them to do. Now that is deep, that is deep. They in their own minds decided that this is something I mean, they didn't, they, they didn't talk to me about Martin Buber and uh, the Talmud and they just, they just talked to me about their life experience, that there was something in their life experience that connected them between what they saw happening to Negroes, as we were called them their own experience as Jews in what might be called the, the Jewish diaspora. So we have uh, this opportunity to speak to you this evening. You now, some people may have come and speak to you uh, based upon what they read. or what they uh, 
has been told to them. I'm speaking to you, not upon, based upon what I read, but what I know, what I saw, from my own personal experience. I saw, now listen to me carefully now, I saw that somehow, I don't know whether it was the Talmud, I don't know. Was it the Old Testament? I don't know. But I saw a simpatico. I saw a segment of the population who looked white from a distance, but up close and personal, when you got close to them, they white, but they were Jews. And they themselves were a small part of the population. But they identified themselves with our struggle during the 1960s. And I never forgot that. And so as years went on, you know, things became, you know, you had the, the uh, state of Israel, Arab-Israeli conflict, and uh, um, you had the issue of uh, racism, anti-Semitism, Palestine, and all of those issues. Um, but if you ground yourself, as I have, and I urge uh, other African Americans of my generation or of younger generation, ground yourself as I have. I've been there, seen there, done that. I've seen the extent to which Blacks and Jews who shared a profound and enduring common interest that transcended any differences that may have existed between them, organized and struggle against racial segregation. And so someone may say, well, if this occurred in the 1960s and 1970s, well, What's happening now? Why why aren't there more? Uh, uh, why 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 are there, for example, um, 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 there are a number of uh, Jews who are participating in the Black Lives Matter movement and other movements, but uh, we hear or see evidence of certain anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. Uh, 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 sayings, anti-Israel uh, slogans or actions on the part of some members of the uh, African-American community. I can't presume to speak and don't presume to speak for the African, all the African-American community. I don't do that. But I do presume to speak for a generation of those African-Americans who were associated with what I call the the uh, King generation. President Obama likes to call the Joshua generation and the Moses generation. But I'm both a part of the Moses and the Joshua generation. And I can tell you Yeah, there are some members of the current Black Lives Matter movement and struggle who have evidence anti-Semitism and anti-Israeli, anti-Israeli, I have to make myself 
less anti less anti Semitic, but anti Israeli uh, uh, sentiments. Warning to suggest that uh, Israel is no longer uh, uh, qualified to be a legitimate state worthy of support. So I say to myself, now, uh, uh, I don't know, you didn't know this when you invited me to speak, but I've been, I was invited to Israel several years ago by the intelligence unit of the Israeli Air Force at a conference, the Herzliya conference. And when I gave a major speech in Israel in, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, all the Israelis, the, more than half of the members of the audience were in Israeli, were in military uniform. And I spoke to them bluntly. I told them they had to go back and look at the charter in which they had been founded. And I told them that as they are uh, seeking to resolve their differences with the Palestinians, they have to decide whether it is consistent with uh, the founding charter of Israel or inconsistent. And uh, I say to uh, those people, much to my surprise, who want to call for the delegitimization of Israel today, in 2020, for example. I'm saying now, okay, now, I understand. I mean, I don't understand, but I, I you know, um, Governments, <laughs> it's really, this is this really government. Yeah, it has been in power for a long period of time. But it's not the same government that was when Israel was founded. And it's, this government will come and go. So don't come and talk to me about, well, Israel is no longer deserving of legitimacy as a country because you disagree with its foreign policy. Okay, you disagree with this foreign policy, argue about that foreign policy in the, in, the, in the marketplace. I don't agree with the foreign policy of the United States and some argument, you know. But there's something that's insidious that is occurring among some segments of a new generation of African Americans that seem to want to isolate and delegitimize the existence of Israel. And uh, you will hardly find a more ardent critic of Israeli policy toward the Palestinians than, uh, than myself. I'm a critic. I understand. I mean, I'm, I'm a critic. But my criticism of the uh, policies of the uh, Israeli government doesn't take me to a point that I want to deny the legitimacy <laughs> of the state of Israel. No, that's, that's, that's a point too far. And that is a point too far for those here in the United States, because you can be, you can be critical. I mean, in and, and marriages, I mean, people, husbands and wives are critical of one another. In relationships, so I, 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 I'm publicly critical of uh, some actions of the state of Israel, but I, I still work wherever I can to support programs of the state of Israel that I think are appropriate. Yeah, I understand. Yes, there is no question in my mind that Israel has shot itself in the foot. I've been there in the, uh, what some people would call the colonial occupation of Palestinian lands. But the answer to that 
is not to say that Israel is not a legitimate state. The answer to that is to try to influence and change domestic Israeli public opinion and put as much pressure you can, just as people put pressure on various states to change their policies. So I am delighted to be uh, have invited to, uh, here to speak. I don't mean to get off track here. Uh, I only want to say this. Blacks and Jews share a profound today enduring common interests that transcend any differences between us. Jews through individuals and organizations have been the most staunch allies in the struggle for racial justice. Do you hear what I just said? We thought that the majority of the 88% of the population, they all look alike, and they did. But we didn't realize they may look alike from a distance, but there was a segment of them during the civil rights movement, Jewish people who came and worked in support of the civil rights movement because they saw a commonality between what we were seeking to do and the legacy of their grandparents. So if there are any questions, I'll take them. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for sharing such interesting and important life stories with us. I, I do want to ask you uh, some questions to reflect on your work with Dr. King. And the first one is, what are some of the messages and ideas in the letter from a Birmingham jail that remain relevant today? What lessons from that letter can we apply to the current critical and social moment? What lessons are relevant to the Birmingham jail? Yeah, lessons from the Birmingham jail is that uh, moderation is not the answer you, that uh, um, we have to understand that uh, the African-American experiences encompass Lots of centuries, so for uh, for for well-meaning people to tell us to be wait and be patient, that's that's not appropriate. The other lesson is that uh, the letter from the Birmingham jail is a conscience. It's a it's a it's a searing plea to the uh, conscience of America. And yeah, I'll, I'll put a heavy, I'll put a heavy one on you. Jewish people of all people in America, of all the segments of people in America, because of their own history, independent of the African American experience, their own history should be the ones most receptive to our pleas for freedom and immediate end of segregation and racial justice. Thank you. I'm having some trouble with my mic, I'm told, but hopefully you can hear me. I can hear you, I can hear you. We know about the strong roots of both the Black Jewish and Black Palestinian alliances. What are the possibilities for a Black Jewish Palestinian alliance? Can Black Americans play a role in building and brokering a just and sustainable peace in Israel Palestine? Wow. That's a big hurdle. whether that can be done. I 
really depends on Israel. You know? Uh, there are some people today who say that the Arab-Israeli conflict is no longer seen as an irreconcilable hostility, but rather as a colonial occupation and violation of international law and human rights subsidized by the United States. Um, Arab minority, for example, constitute 21% of the population of Israel. But the new nation state law, uh, only Jewish Israelis have the right to self-determination. So I, I, we're available to assist and advise in any way we can. But I also respect the rights of Israel to determine its own destiny. It's not for Clarence Jones and a group of well-intended people in San Francisco to tell Israel what it should or should not do. We can only advise you as to what you think you should consider. Thank you. How can we respond to the rising white supremacy that is targeting both blacks and Jews? By pointing it out and being unequivocal. By pointing it out, I mean, I, I don't understand uh, political leaders who have a problem in just pointing out what they see understand just just calling it out when you see it just just you know it doesn't make you it doesn't make you so, uh, some kind of crazy radical it just means means that you're some person who really has a continuing commitment to the facts that's all i can tell you we have a lot of questions coming in I want to um, ask one more question as a LGBTQ religious activist. I want to hear more about your relationship with Baird Rustin and some of the history about you and Reverend King surrounding the challenging homophobic fears of leaders in that era. And I'd like to know your thoughts on how we can peacefully disrupt this long entrenched trope in in the church um, that is in its own way a kind of violence. Oh, yeah. I mean, first of all, let's go to the March on Washington. Um, members of the March on Washington yeah. committee, um, the majority of whom were uh, ministers, Black Bad, they opposed Bayard Rustin who to become executive director, who was the favorite candidate of A. Philip Randolph and Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, when the time came to formally put to a motion whether who should be the executive director, the, uh, the, the, the black church leaders used whatever they could to derail the uh, the motion submitted by A. Phil Randolph that Baird Rustin be uh, director. And Baird and Dr. King spoke in support of the motion. And uh, he quoted a, a section of the scripture which says, in effect, those of us who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Who are we to judge? Um, and the motion was rushed through and Baird was selected as um, executive director. The homophobia was deep, very deep. And, uh, and later on, I remember after I had, a uh, few years after I had uh, moved to California, I think Gavin Newsom was mayor then, 
and he was pushing for a resolution of same-sex marriage. And I remember going into a uh, church someplace. It was a Hispanic church, but it had a lot of black ministers there. And they were attacking me for not saying that Dr. King would be opposed to same-sex marriage. And I can say, well, honestly, they never, I would say to them, uh, the subject never came up during the whole period of time of my seven and a half years relationship with him when he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. But I can tell you this, that uh, Dr. King was a deeply religious person. And he would probably pose the question to you. Um, God loves and creates all of his children. So why does he continue to create so many gay children? Why does he, God, continue to have so many gay children born? Unless he loved them. So I said, to these people who were vociferous and attacking me, I said, the Lord must be sending us a message that if we are all sons of the children of God and we are all loved, then you have to ask yourself, why does God continue to create so many gay children, unless he loved them. You, you tell me that. That's the way I answer the question. I love that. I think you said to me, um, God loves, God loves gays. That's what it yeah, is. I said, yeah, I said, why would gays, why would God, why would God, God create, continue to create so many gay children, unless he loved them? So here's a question from a student drawing on a life dedicated to nonviolent resistance. What role do you envision nonviolence to play in future struggles for justice? Well, regrettably, as seductively as violence is, uh, it has proven that the most effective way of gaining a mass base of support to fundamentally change that which you oppose is really through nonviolent struggle. There is nothing that those people who support those things that we are opposed, those people who, uh, who support uh, unjust police actions, uh, excessive force, the thing they want more than ever. They want us to engage in violence. They, 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 they welcome us to engage in violence because they know that if we engage in violence, that our actions of violence will uh, um, overcome will uh, cause the message of injustice to be subordinated. So they welcome us to be violent because they don't want our message of injustice to be heard and seen. So it requires great discipline to be nonviolent so that the message that we seek to convey is not obscured by acts of violence. I love that. Why do some African Americans hold Jewish Americans responsible for what the state of Israel is doing, real or perceived? 
Are Chinese Americans responsible for the abuses of the Chinese communist regime? Uh, why do they do that? Because they are intellectually challenged, uninformed, and emotionally misled. Hmm? Um, you have to make a distinction. American Jews, those who are not Jewish, uh, Jews, uh, have to decide, look, there's the state of Israel, and it's foreign policy, et cetera. So American Jews have to decide to what extent it can support uh, the foreign policy of the state of Israel or the domestic policy or cannot. And the real challenge is simply because someone, for example, who is Negro or Black, is critical of something that the Israeli government does, doesn't mean that they are automatically anti-Semitic. It means they're critical of the policy of the state of Israel. That's all it means, okay? I do not agree with the domestic or foreign policy of Benjamin Netanyahu, the president of the state of Israel. But I'm not an Israeli, I'm an American. I'm an outsider, but I can express my opinion, okay? So if you've asked my opinion, I say I don't agree with it. Now the fact that I disagree with him, I mean, I can't imagine anybody in their reasonable right mind who could say, because I disagree with him, I'm anti-Semitic or anti-Israel. No, I'm anti, I'm anti-Israel. I'm anti the policies that Israel are pursuing but not against the state of Israel. Big difference. This is sort of a, a follow-up to that. Another student asks, I noticed that you mentioned you're often critical of the Israeli government. Do you find that anti-Israeli sentiment is inherently anti-Semitic? What is the line there? Do I find that with it? That no. See, that's a trap. That is a trap. That is a trap that says, if you are critical of the policies of the Israeli government, you therefore must be anti-Semitic. No, nobody could, would seriously say that to me. I don't know about anybody else. I mean, I, I mean, they couldn't seriously say that to me and look me in my eye. You mean to tell me that I have forfeited my right to be critical of the policy of the Israeli government? And that as you look back at the body of my work, I'm going to be almost, almost, in less than two months, two months, I'm going to be 90 years old. So you mean to tell me you're going to look at my 90 year legacy and you're going to tell me to my face? that I am anti-Israel because I criticize uh, the foreign or domestic policy of Israel, you can't be serious. So I, I dismiss it, I wouldn't even, I don't pay attention to it. Thank you. What would you recommend United States students of all backgrounds do to gain an in-depth and authentic understanding of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? They should come to USF and sit at the feet of you and myself Jonathan Greenberg and the other gentleman 
and just have extended discussions. That's what they should do. They should stop running their mouth. Come and sit at our feet. Engage us in discussion. We're open to anything that you can ask. Nothing is inappropriate or off limits. That's what they should do. Can you speak to Reverend Barber and Theo Harris and the new Poor People's Campaign? Do you think the movement will be able to galvanize our society in the way that the Poor People's Campaign of the 60s did? I am hopeful. I don't know that they will. I am hopeful it's a worthwhile objective. I support their efforts, but I have no idea whether or not they will succeed, but I'm, I support their efforts. Okay, one more question. What do you have to say about Black Americans today who resonate with the police brutality inflicted on Palestinians in Israel. Does this connection cloud the judgment of Jews as a whole within the black community? I'll say now, it again. Now, hold on a moment now, hold on. Let's just get something clear. What the police do to African-Americans, what police in the United States domestic police forces in the United States do to African-American citizens has to be evaluated on the merits of what those actions are. What police actions occur in Israel by Israeli domestic police forces against Palestinians. They have to be evaluated for what they are. If you are telling me or you want to suggest that the police the Israeli police in Israel are treating the Palestinians similarly to the way in which American domestic police treat African Americans. There may be there may be instances where that similarity has some resonance, but. We are two different, we are two countries. I want to restrain and curtail the racist actions of domestic police forces in the United States. I have limited capacity to restrain the police forces in Israel against Palestinians. Thank you. An essential organizing principle of critical race theory is to center people who have been directly harmed by systemic forms of identity based caste systems. Therefore, it's not important to center Palestinian voices and experience and tactics in the struggle for freedom in their own land. It's not a what? I'm not there. Therefore, is it not important to center Palestinian voices and experience and tactics in the struggle for freedom in their own land? And Israel governs not 20%, but 50% of the entire population, which is Palestinians, if you include all territories Israel governs. That's asked by 
Well, that is a, that is a, that is an existential fact that you're asking. Well, that has to, the, the, the 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 actions of the Israeli is, is Israel the Israelis have to be judged based on those actions. They have to be judged based on those actions. They are either um, um, clinically. Uh, in the interest of uh, um, domestic um, Israeli, domestic uh, um, police management, or they're over the top, or they're a violation of human rights by any standard. But I'm not gonna sit here in Palo Alto, California, and seek to judge Israeli police actions unless it's clearly shown to me. And if it is clearly shown to me, as in some cases it has been, and I have been critical, then I will speak out of judgment. But I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a domestic uh, Israeli uh, uh, Palo Alto Supreme Court to which I can. Uh, uh, determine whether uh, an Israeli police action has been appropriate or inappropriate. I can look at it from afar and I can tell you very quickly as to whether or not I think it's appropriate or inappropriate. I have no problem in doing that. A couple more questions on this. How do we as black people carry the torch of anti-racist work in our professional and personal lives while protecting and uplifting our communities? Hey, that's a challenge you gotta remember from whence you came. No? Uh, you can decide uh, whether or not you reach a stage in your uh, professional, political, development that uh, what you believe you have achieved is so unique that it is enduring to you but unconnected to the journey that you have taken okay or you can view yourself as a representative of the best that has gone before and try to conduct yourself in a way that as you, as you surmount and get over the fence of segregation, you should always come back and look over the fence and see whether there's somebody else you can reach down and bring over to join you. Thank you for that. Another question, what do you think of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement? Should USF follow BDS? USF should not follow BDS. Okay. USF should maintain its independence to be critical where it's appropriate to be critical of actions of the state of Israel and its foreign policy but should not engage into a policy which seeks to delegitimize uh, the authenticity of a state of Israel. Now, I'm ready to put my foot up the butt a visual and his policies publicly and privately whenever it is. But that's one thing. I'm not for saying because I am so critical of what Israel's done, that therefore it no longer has the right to exist as a state. I'm saying the hold on now. That's a bridge too far. Okay. I'm willing 
to criticize that state, I'm willing to put whatever I can on that state, but I'm not gonna delegitimize the existence of that state. And I'm not gonna do that, especially when I know something about the diaspora and the history of the Jewish experience. I'd be crazy. You don't like what Israel's doing? Fine, challenge it in the United Nations, challenge it. But don't get me to join you and say you want to say it no longer has a right to exist as a, as a legitimate state. I will not do that. Do you feel the Palestinians are diverting the Black Lives Matter movement from the real issues that Black Americans experience? I don't credit, no, I, 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 well, not to my knowledge. I mean, no, I, I, don't, I don't credit the Palestinian movement with trying to devote the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, if they want to participate in our movement and try to influence, fine. But I send them a warning, you know? Ours is a domestic political movement. And where appropriate, where we see some tangible parallel links between what we're doing and what you seek to do, fine. But under no circumstances, try to dictate the content or the strategy and tactics of our movement. By doing so, you insult our intelligence. One more question. How should being an outsider to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict inform how you learn and form opinions about it? Well, today, we, we live in the social media. And uh, uh, print and electronic media, I mean, there's so many sources of information uh, there's a high bar that's been raised. Uh, it cannot be said that you don't have access to information that can inform you. You just have to take the time to study it. Um, so I, I, I don't know other, other than to, you just have to take the time to study the sources of information that you present that have come that have been presented to you or that uh, come to your attention. I have two last questions. Um, so often the campus climate surrounding Israel Palestine is so divided and incendiary. Is there a way to make the campus more hospitable for students who want to engage in dialogue? Yeah. There is. First of all, uh, let's come to recognize this is uh, this is uh, United this is uh, United States, San Francisco. It's not Israel. It's not Palestine. It's not admittedly territories that have been occupied by Israeli military forces. We are here in the United States. And we're here at the campus of University of San Francisco. Well, by and large, there is unfettered opportunity to express your opinions and to engage in various forms of nonviolent, peaceful action. 
So some ways I resent having any elements of a conflict outside of the United States, trying to dictate and determine the content and form in which I can discuss that conflict within the United States. That offends me. I don't need anybody to tell me how I can discuss the issue. I'm perfectly competent to discuss it myself. Just as I said, I only had one more question. Now several more have come in. We um, want to hold on to this proximity with you, Dr. Jones. So here's the next one. Do you have, uh, what are the most important fights that black Americans need to put their attention to at this time? And I would add to that question, in this these days leading up to the election and the anxiety of what's to come, what, message of inspiration can you give to us uh, in, in, these, in, these, in these times for today, now, from you? Well, message of inspiration comes from words which are not original with me. They come from, among other things, Frederick Douglass. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, it never will. The most effective form of exercising political power today in the United States as we are constituted as a government is voting. You may not like what I said, but that's the most effective power. So voting, participation in the voting process, actual registration, and then actual voting pursuant to that registration is the most powerful political act of self-government and the exercise of political power over your own destiny you can do. Or state it another way. Don't come to me carrying some powerful banner seeking to enlist support for this. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear whatever banner you have. I don't want to hear any. I don't, don't show me any placard. Don't show me any banner. Don't show me any. I think the only thing you can show me is the most powerful thing that you can show me is your voter registration card. That I will pay attention to. And then when you tell me you registered to vote, that's when I'm gonna put my arms around you and say, hallelujah, brother and sister, coming to the 21st century of justice. What can I tell you? Dr. Jones, we wanna put our arms around you and bless you and ask that God give the blessing of strength, stamina and health to you for for many more years. And 90 more to go, 180 years. <laughs> sounds good to me. And three months, my mother would and want. Three months, right, right. Thank you so much for sharing these important stories with us and lessons and responses to our questions. We've had um, guests from all over the country and many students from USF tonight. We're just really grateful from Jewish studies and social justice. Thank you for honoring us with this year's lecture. No, it's my honor. It's my honor. Thank you so much. Hope you'll invite me back. Thank you. Thank you.
This concludes our evening and we're so glad you joined us and stay tuned for what's to come uh, in the next semester. <laughs>